Debbie had talked to me a little bit about the fact that sometimes ordering blood products are, is a little confusing. And if you thought it was confusing before you got set down in front of the EMR, uh, once you open up the screens, you have no doubt it's confusing. So mostly this lecture today is just to walk through the screenshots and kind of talk about when you order this, this is what happens. And this may bring up some questions. This isn't going to take a really long time to, to do. Um, so you may have some questions related to transfusion, of which at the end of this we'll feel just about anything you want to talk about. So here is what happens when you type in the word type on ClinView. And what you'll notice is you get some stuff, you get some stuff that has nothing to do with, with blood banking, but you also get ABO type and RH. Okay, you get collagen type 2 IgG, throw that one out, influenza type D, throw that one out. Rho D type, remember D is the same thing as RH. This might be somebody that you just want to know if they're RH positive or negative, for instance, a pregnant woman. Um, these are radiology ones, and then type and screen. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the difference between type and screen and type and cross. And this, this is an opportunity where you can end up being much smarter than some of your attendings. Did I say that? Um, <laughs> so um, with a type and screen, um, you get a blood type, you get an RH, and you get an antibody screen. What we do is, is we have some pre-prepared antibody preparations with many of the common antibodies. And we use two different sets of that to screen for any of the common antibodies. And um, that is going to be, okay, your bread and butter ordering when you're dealing with possible transfusion and typing is type and screen, okay? Type and cross, what happens when you say type and cross, you also specify the number of units, one unit, two unit, whatever, um, and those units will be pulled off the shelf, and the, there, are, there are little segments that hang out off the units. You know when you don't get blood and they have all that tubing? And you see them going ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, with the little tubing clamp thing. Um, those make the segments that we use for blood testing. And um, we would take some of those segments and we would test them and say, oh yeah, this unit is compatible. And now we move it to another shelf in the blood bank refrigerator and that blood is sitting waiting for your patient and your patient alone. Okay. It cannot be changed unless you call me and tell me, to, uh, or tell the lab, basically, to release those units. So what happens is the vast bulk of the time you're going to order type and screen. If you foresee an immediate need or an urgent need for transfusion, you're going to order type and cross. And I think what happened was my generation of physicians and the people just a little bit below me watched too many medical TV shows where they were always typing cross in people. And so what happens is my generation is kind of prone to ordering type and cross when they mean type and screen. And it's been kind of a constant educational process to get people to understand that when you you order a type and cross, nobody else in the hospital can use those units and they'll you tell me that, that they can be released. So most of the time you're going to order type and screen. Now, if you look in the order management uh, part of physician experience, you're, you're going to notice you're going to get, uh, you type, we typed in type and, okay? 
you're gonna get some some uh, order. You make some orders for Rogam if you had a pregnant person who needed it. Or you're gonna get some postpartum orders. Um, but down here, where we have the prenatal lab work, um, here's our type and screen again. Okay, if somebody had just been typed, you might want to order the antibody screen. Um, there's a few other things in there in the prenatal lab uh, with lab work. But notice, you know, when you do that, you're not going to get any orders to, to transfuse. That. And this is another view of position experience order management. And what we typed in there was cross. Okay, and notice we have several choices for cross match. Cross match times one, times two, times three, times four. Okay, obviously, if you choose cross match times one, uh, you're gonna uh, you're gonna have one unit cross match. You have two, you're gonna have two cross match. We only go up to four because probably if you wanna give more than four units of blood to your patient, we probably need to have a conversation first to see what's going on because maybe there's something else we need to be doing. Um, these two are cross match one and two additional units. That, that's an order for the person you've already been given blood. Let's say three days ago you gave them two units. Okay. Um, now you you know, you're saying, oh, I don't know. I think I want to give them one more unit before I, I discharge them. So you would you would choose cross match one additional unit. So this this set of orders does require you to be able to keep track of the fact that this patient's already been transfused. And you know, when a patient gets kind of uh, transferred from service to service. You need to, when you pick up the patient, you need to be aware of that. Um, for instance, say maybe surgery had the patient and now medicine has the patient after the post-op period and they're almost ready for discharge. So, so that's, that's important. Um, now we've only been talking about packed red cells at this point. Um, there are some other orders for some other <coughs> Okay, cryoprecipitate, frozen plasma, and this is actually kind of a misnomer because we really don't have fresh frozen plasma. We have FP24. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, platelets, packed ribs, and there's the FP24. So actually, they have it in there both ways. So what you are always going to want to choose in this screen is two units FP24. Now what happens in practice around here, because we don't even have fresh frozen plasma, is those units get interpreted as FP24. But if you have an, it, a, a, a situation where you feel like you need fresh frozen plasma as opposed to FP24, again, pick up the phone, talk to the lab, talk to me, talk to Dr. Fender. Um, and let me just go into why why a few years ago the Red Cross changed, changed the plasma product we get. Um, I know for a fact all of you who have rotated with the hospitalists have been pimped a few times about trial. Maybe once or twice, right? And taco once or twice, once in a while. Okay, I see some knowing nods, okay. Um, because that's a real issue with the patients our hospitalists get. So it's important. And what you need to know is that in response to a few years ago, the discovery of this disorder trolley, we used to just lump it all into some of the other diffuse alveolar damage, adult respiratory distress syndrome stuff. But we discovered there was a special form of adult respiratory distress that had to do with getting plasma, particularly in frozen plasma products, because that's where the most of it is. You know, packed red cells has a little bit of plasma, platelets has a little bit of plasma. Um, frozen plasma, of course, that's what it is. <laughs> so, um, 
the uh, the deal was if you take the plasma and you freeze it over 24 hours that slow freezing precipitates out the antibodies that are the ones that cause trouble. So it's like, yeah, no brainer there. We'll do it like that. Um, but there's a, a caveat with that um, because um, when you do it that way, the plasma becomes deficient in two clotting factors. Okay, factor five and factor eight. Okay, used to be in the old days in a town like Kirksville when we had a hemophiliac come through the door because we don't carry factor eight in house because it has a short shelf life and we just don't use it that much. And we didn't have any concentrated factor eight, we'd go, ah, we'll give them a little plasma. And so we might give them one unit of plasma. If they were young and healthy, they could handle the volume overload and they got some factor eight. Well, what you need to remember is for that purpose, FP24 doesn't cut it. What you would want to do is order cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate, as you probably remember, the main reason you order cryoprecipitate is because it's got a lot of fibrinogen in it. It's the biggest bang for your buck fibrinogen in a little package. But it's also pretty heavy in factor A. So if you were ever in a situation where you needed to transfuse or give some factor eight to someone who's a hemophiliac, but, the, but you don't want to wait for factor eight to get to Kirksville uh, by the pharmacy, you could give them cryoprecipitate. Something else you need to know about FP24, the Red Cross and the other major blood banks in the country changed um, their supply because we also found out that women, particularly multiparous women, had higher levels of the antibodies that caused trolley. So about 95% of our FP24 comes from male donors. So it's almost exclusively a male blood product. Um, that's, that's worth knowing. Um, a couple other Kirksville specific things. Um, we talked about we talked about cryo a little. If I if you were to ask me what the most underutilized blood product is in um, this hospital, it's cryo precipitate because I think a lot of times people um, are giving people plasma when in reality they're just mostly wanting to give them some fibrinogen. And uh, with cryo precipitate, it comes in little bags. Uh, you can solve the volume problem because, you know, a, a unit of uh, frozen plasma is anywhere from about 350 to 450 mils. Um, you, can, you can do a lot with those little bags of cryo that are about 25 mils. Um, and I, I also would say the ordering pattern here is when people do order cryo, they don't order nearly as much of it as I, I came to expect uh, when I worked at MU. Um, pretty much in most larger hospitals, when people order cryo, they order it in increments of five or 10. It would be not unusual at all for us to get an order for 10 units of cryo or 20 units of cryo. And when we get an order for cryo around here, it's like one or two. So um, as you go to rotations at other sites, pay attention to how other places order cryo. Um, it's important to talk about platelets a little bit because platelets in a hospital this size, including ours, um, are not always going to be available on demand. The reason for that is we, te we tend to use single donor phoresis product and that only has a shelf life of 72 hours because platelets are stored at room temperature. <clears throat> So they only have a shelf life of 72 hours. So unless you have enough patients who need platelets, um, who that it justifies keeping <clears throat> keeping them in house for three days, and really my Kirksville standard is almost two days because 
it took a day to get there. Um, it's not it's not cost effective nor feasible. Um, so if you have a patient who you anticipate a need for platelets, um, we probably need at least one day's advance notice about that. If you have an emergent situation that needs platelets, you want to call the pathologist on call and we can have the Red Cross issue an emergent unit in the old days. We used to have those brought up by Highway Patrol. They kind of have their own delivery system now. But it's still going to be, you know, several hours before it gets there. So that also changes um, your thought patterns. Because if you're starting to deal with something that's massive transfusion types of stuff, you know, this blood bank is not equipped to handle the kinds of situations that require massive transfusion. We're only a level three trauma center, you know, compared to a level one trauma center. So that also should, our availability of various blood products should also temper your thought about whether the patient needs to be transported to a level one trauma center uh, upon immediate stabilization. So, so that's, that's something to remember. One final thing, and I can say that we've made it from July to almost October without any clinical medical student or resident doing this. This actually, this actually happened a few years ago. Remember, it's called frozen plasma for a reason. It is frozen. Frozen things need to be thawed. Okay, we put them in a water bath, we thaw them, it takes about 20 minutes. A few years ago, this person will remain nameless because I think they maybe got smarter between then and now. Um, I got a call one night, and it was a, a brand spanking new intern who went to some other school than Kirksville. Um, I will say that much. And uh, said to me, he was upset because he had issued an order for frozen plasma and it wasn't here yet. And maybe he had issued, he called down maybe five, five minutes ago, ten minutes ago. And I said, well, you know, it takes 20 minutes to thaw it because, you know, we put it in a water bath. And he said to me very indignantly, well, why don't you put it in the microwave? <laughs> And I took a long pause, and I said, what happens when you put an egg in the microwave? Well, it cooks it. Egg's full of albumin, isn't it? Yeah. Well, what the hell do you think is in plasma? <laughs> and there was this long, stony silence. And, and, and I said, you know... I know I'm old and a little addled in the head, but do me a favor and assume I do know something about my job. <laughs> so, so that was the end of that story. So remember, it takes at least 20 minutes. That's why I tell the story. Okay, if you're looking in ClinView, see you get the same deal with the cross matches and the cross match one additional unit, um, two additional units but they'll be reversed, okay? See, what you're picking up on here is, depending on what, what you're using to view this, you're gonna get different views. Um, here's what happens if you start to type in transfuse, okay? Because in addition to ordering the product, you have to submit an order to transfuse it, okay? Because the first set of orders only tells the lab to do what the lab's supposed to do. This set of orders tells nursing to do what nursing's supposed to do. So it's a two-step process. Um, and basically, um, this is within a time frame, and there's several different ways they have blood spelled out and blood not spelled out. That doesn't mean transfuse it over that period of time because our policy is that any unit has to be transfused within four hours of receipt to the floor. And generally speaking, the unit itself needs to go in within two hours. And the reason for that is, is remember, this is something that's been sitting in the refrigerator. 
and now it's sitting at room temperature. And just like things that have to do with your food, um, you, you are going to have to pay attention to the fact that this is a product that was stored cold and is now at room temperature. And so you want to prevent the possibility of any sort of bacterial contamination. So that, those orders have to do with within what time frame you want the transfusion to happen. And, and again, you've got um, the transfused cryo, transfused frozen plasma, FP24 platelets, and packed, <coughs> packed red cells. And, and notice that kind of in this set of orders, blood is synonymous uh, with, with packed red cells. Um, if you want to transfuse cryo, you want to transfuse cryo. And, and the only thing that's different with the, this, this set of orders is this just tells somebody to transfuse it. You just didn't specify when you want to transfuse, so it's up to the, the nursing floor to, to, to do that. Okay, and this is just to remind you again, type and screen means you get ABO or H antibody screen. We will not prepare a unit for you. And um, that's probably the most important thing about this little talk. So that is pretty much all I have for you on this part of it. I guess my question is, is this is your chance to ask any kind of question about transfusions or experiences you've had and you weren't sure what to do. Uh, so <coughs> any questions? Yeah. How long does it take once a unit is actually prepared? Okay. Um, the question was for the folks out in the remote area. If you order a type and screen, how long does it take to prepare a cross match? Well, of course, you you've ordered the screen, and now you want to you want to use one of those orders to say cross match two units. By and large, it doesn't take anywhere from 10, 10 to 15 minutes um, because we've already done the antibody screen. All we have to do is pull two units off the shelf and do it. Um, that brings up another issue. Let's say you had a real immediate need. Um, what you may want to do <coughs> is order either type specific uncrossed match for emergent release uh, and that comes with signing paperwork and, and that's something the attending actually has to sign for. Um, but uh, say you needed something right now like you're, you're in the OR. Um, it's not unusual for us to send up type specific uncrossed match because we've done an antibody screen on the patient already, see in that instance. Uh, and so we know something, it's, you know, even in the ER, even if you haven't done an, uh, an antibody screen, there are going to be times you just order O negative on, on cross match. Um, and um, that will be even faster. But generally speaking, plan on 10 or 15 minutes because it just doesn't take that long to pull one off the shelf, check it out, run it upstairs. We can convert. We can it, one, if you've been smart and gotten the type and screen already on the patient. It you know it's it's real easy to convert that to a cross. Evans, you seem to comment every year about how you know O negative versus O positive when it would be appropriate. It's usually a very good review for us as health staff um, who are ordering that potentially. Okay, the question was, could you please review about the whole business of O negative versus O positive, when we, particularly when we're dealing with an O negative unit shortage? And it's, a, it's an important question, and the reason I do bring it up every time I talk about transfusion or do a lecture about transfusion is because it happens a lot around here. Um, something to remember is that even though more people that are donating blood uh, than ever before, the demand for blood goes up about 10% a year in the healthcare setting. So we're still not keeping up with the demand. O negative patients make up 
roughly 8% of all people who donate blood. So they're a premium. They are definitely a premium. And because of that, the Red Cross and other, other entities that are in the blood banking business um, have to really carefully distribute their O negative units so that they are mostly at the places that need them the most, i.e. level one trauma centers, um, or places that have big transplant surgeries or stuff like that. Um, that puts us kind of low on the list. When, when I first came here in 2000, it was typical to have six or eight units of O negative sitting in my refrigerator over, over across the street and lab. Um, and actually it wasn't across the street, it was way across the street because the lab was way over there then. Um, that number has dwindled to where on a good day, I might have four, I might have four O negative units. A lot of days this summer, I had three. Um, what that means is, is as the medical director of the blood bank, I have a responsibility to this community. And that responsibility is to protect the most vulnerable people in terms of our blood bank population. And of course that would be women of reproductive age, particularly pregnant women of reproductive age. Um, so, whenever possible, I have to try to keep my own negative units there for that pregnant woman who slipped off the boat dock at Thousand <coughs> Hills and now is coming in with a bleed. And she happens to be O negative. So, it means there will be times at nights and weekends and particularly from, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, what I like to line out is trauma season, <laughs> um, that if you have an elderly patient who's O negative, you may be asked to accept a unit of O positive. Now, you know, this intuitively feels wrong because you're like, the state is positive. Keep in mind a few things. Number one, RHD, uh, RH, the D antigen, is a weak antigen. It's a pretty weak antigen. Um, it has a variable ability to sensitize a patient. There was a study done in a bunch of major trauma centers that showed that in you know, some large number of major trauma cases, over a thousand, that less than one-third of those people, even though they got O negative, or O positive blood, I'm sorry, got O positive blood that were O negative patients, less than one-third of them developed an antibody to D. Um, there are a lot of factors in that. Obviously, the more O positive units you give them, the higher the likelihood they'll sensitize. And Obviously, the more they're bleeding out, the less likely they will to sensitize because it's not staying in them as long. <coughs> so, but the bottom line is, is that even just giving one or two units of O positive blood to an O negative person doesn't necessarily sensitize them. If it does sensitize them, it's a fairly weak antigen. It's not one of the antigens we associate with severe hemolytic uh, transfusion reactions. Um, it um, also is an antigen that has more deleterious effects on the fetus than it does on adults. Okay, this is clearly deadly for fetuses. And um, if we go back to my 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 uh, ethical mindset of I must protect the most vulnerable people in the community, well that fetus is even more vulnerable than, than the pregnant mom. So um, again, it puts me in the position of occasionally having to tell y'all that well, you're going to have to take an O positive unit on this person. Now, generally speaking, once you've broke the seal, once you've given them an O positive unit, you probably ought to give them O positive units for the duration of their hospital stay. Um, because the O negative, giving them an O negative unit doesn't 
change, doesn't statistically change anything after you've already given them a positive unit. Um, so um, if the patient is a, a female beyond reproductive age or a male, um, you, you may well get a call saying, you know, that we're going to have to give you a positive on this because we've only got two units of negative counts. Um, so that's the, that's the basic review. Um, we try that out here. That's why yeah, yeah, and I'm glad you asked me. I'm glad you asked because it's one that usually in every lecture I talk about at some point in time. They did that a lot in the military, and their advice was that for women, they say all your negatives. For women, they get negative. For the guys, they see the one the second time. Then they get issues. Right. And you receive the Mm -hmm. Right, and you always document that's what they got. Yeah, and see, in the military, most of those women are going to be of reproductive age. So if it's a female reproductive age, you're going to give her a negative. And um, there was something I was going to say about that, too, that just slipped my mind. Um, I was just thinking, you are talking about female, you are talking about males. Oh, I know what it was. If you ever do a rotation at a huge major trauma, level one trauma place like Parkland and Dallas, actually they have standing orders for major traumas. If the patient is male, they get O positive. Uh, you know, no questions asked. You just you, that's what you get. And so, it, you know, at least at this institution, we we have the flexibility to be able to call you up and say, hey, this is what's going on. Any other questions? So if you do like a type and screen, how long is it there? Is there a certain window that that screen lasts before you have to rescreen the 40 cross net? Yeah, because once, um, you know, generally speaking, we say 72 hours. Um, because once you've transfused them, let's say now you've transfused them, you know, how the cross match is the time, there's a time limit on the cross match and it runs out. And, um, because what happens is, let's say now you've transfused them, and let's say they actually have an antibody, but it's at such a low level that um, that you don't uh, pick it up on the antibody <coughs> screen. Now you've given them a unit that actually had that antibody in it, but they tested negative, right? Because they, they, they were actually, they're a false negative. They were actually positive for this, but they're, their titer is so low, we don't pick it up. Now you've given them a unit of blood that has that, let's say. So within 72 hours, you may see evidence of that antibody ramping up and actually now appearing on the antibody screen. I've seen, I've seen that happen uh, a fair number of times. You know, like we'll give somebody, they were like, particularly an older person, they were in two weeks ago, let's say, and they got transfused two weeks ago, and they had a negative antibody screen. Now they come in, they've got a positive antibody screen. Well, it turns out they probably had a low level of something that was below the threshold of detection on the screen, and now we've ramped it up. So, so that's, that's how that works. Um, that brings up another important topic. Um, which is actually kind of a sidelight, which is something that gets that I get calls about every once in a while, which is ordering a CBC on a person who's been transfused. <laughs> Generally, it's not worth the trouble to have the pathologist review the smear. I mean, you may well need a CBC, but. Um, Remember the life of a red. How long is the life? I want to ask this question. How long is the life of a red blood cell? 90 to 120 days. 120 days, give or take, right? <clears throat> so if you get and ask for a pathologist to review the smear, you're actually saying to the pathologist here, look at their blood and somebody else's. So um, it may not tell you what you need to know. When it does, the one time the exception to that rule is if you want the pathologist to look for schistocytes. Because if you're worried about hemolysis, you might want the pathologist to look for schistocytes. And that would be that would be a valid reason. But hopefully you'd also order an LDH and a haptoglobin if you were worried about hemolysis. So, so that was another sidelight that kind of goes along with your question. Yeah. 
Do we have any kind of protocols here for massive transfusions that would be needed if it exhausted our local supply? Like these are people who are known O and have a negative HIV and hepatitis serologies that work at the hospital, any, anything like that, where we can collect blood locally? We don't have any protocol to collect blood locally because we don't have the facility to test it. I mean, you can collect all the blood locally you want, but we have no ability here to test it. Right. I mean, yeah. sometimes they're, anyway. Now, what you can do, let's just say, I mean, first of all, we have a limited massive transfusion protocol because bottom line is if they're really massive, they don't need to be here. Uh, but... Um, in terms of when we're kind of dealing day by day with like say a shortage of open eggs um some of that is just keeping in close contact with the red cross with trying to trying to get what we can get um but we don't really have a local means of being able to collect blood now that said you know those statistics i just gave everybody about the demand for blood versus the number of o negatives I would encourage, if you have friends that you know are O negative, I would encourage your friends to hook up with one of the, the many programs the Red Cross has with frequent partners. Because, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. The more O negative donors that, that we get, the, the, the better our blood supply is. Other questions? What about transfusion reactions? Might, so once in a while, people call me once in a while about transfusion reactions. What's the most common kind of transfusion reaction? Not urticarial. Febrile. Febrile. Urticarial is number two. Okay. Febrile is the most common transfusion reaction. That's going to be the most common thing someone calls and gets you out of bed and says, I think Mr. So-and-so or Ms. Such-and-Such -such is, having, is having a febrile transfusion reaction. Okay, what's the criteria for, the, right off the bat, the temperature criteria for a febrile transfusion reaction? Take a guess. One degree Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit above baseline. Notice underline above baseline. Okay, it doesn't count if your patient's already 100.9 because I can't tell. You know, is the patient did the patient's fever get higher because the patient's sick, or did the patient's fever get higher because it's a transfusion reaction? So, you know, that doesn't mean don't call, but it means you may not get the answer. You, you know, if you still think it's related to the transfusion, even if the patient's febrile, I want you to call so we'll do the workup. Uh, and then you'll call the lab and get the, the, the things you need to order to do the transfusion workup. The lab does what they need to do, which is re-cross match and re-antibody screen the blood and make sure that checks out and check for clerical errors and they do all that. And then once once our end of it has checked out, you know, we can tell you, you know, everything checks out. Um, I think it's okay to transfuse this person, but I'd pre treat them with Tylenol. Okay, so, so that's the important thing with febrile transfusion reaction is once we've done our workup, we can pretty well assure that, um, that, uh, if it's negative, you can go ahead and transfuse them. Um, we'll talk about urticarial and allergic <coughs> ones a little bit too because they are the second most common. And the important thing you need to remember there, two things. Number one is the more plasma that's in a product, the more likely you are uh, that if they have a reaction, it's <coughs> an allergic reaction. Um, so. It's, you know, like basically with, with plasma, you don't get febrile transfusion reactions because the mechanism for that process happens on the red cells and you only have a few red cells in a unit you know, of plasma. Uh, but with the allergic transfusion reaction, 
it is very definitely coupled to, to antibodies in the plasma. And it can be whimsical, it can be from unit to unit, it can be donor specific. Um, you have to worry about people having IgE deficiency if they have an allergic reaction. But the, the number one thing to know is that the more plasmas in the product, if they have a reaction, it's very likely to be an allergic reaction. The other thing to remember is, is that just like with a lot of allergic things, the more allergic reactions they've had to transfusion, the higher the likelihood they move into anaphylactic transfusion reactions. So you want to get a good history from people if they've ever had transfusion reactions and if, it were, if they were allergic. Because if you have somebody who's had multiple allergic transfusion reactions, you might want to write an order to put an EpiPen by your bedside. So um, there are, you know, many, many considerations with that. Um, most of the other, all the stuff you have to learn for boards about acute hemolytic and delayed hemolytic, you most of the time will never experience um, in practice you might see some of the delayed hemolytic reactions, um, particularly if you have if you end up practicing in some place with a lot of of different ethnicities, because a lot of the anti the antibodies that are associated uh, with the delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions tend to tend to be clustered in higher concentrations in people who live south of the equator. So um, that's just kind of an interesting aside because there's a lot of interesting genetic stuff about how those antibodies may have had a protective effect against malaria. So that's kind of a, a little fascinating aside. Anything else? Yes? Is the albumin we give considered a blood product or is it something? It's, a, it's actually a pharmacy product because what happens is albumin is fractionated, okay? Remember ninth grade, ninth grade uh, physical science where you learned how gasoline was made. Fuel oil was down here in the fractionation column and gasoline, jet fuel was at the top. Um, that's how albumin is made. It's fractionated, so it's actually cooked and reconfigured. And that's actually why, if any of you had an experience with taking care of a Jehovah's Witness, they might accept albumin because they see albumin as this cooked thing. Now, some won't, but a lot of them do. They see albumin as this cooked thing, and it's not really blood anymore. And uh, it's actually, it's actually kind of an interesting, an interesting conundrum from time to time if one of your patients is a Jehovah's Witness because. There's a little bit of variability in what they will and won't accept uh, in terms of blood products. Usually, <coughs> recombinant things, fractionated things, things that come out of a slime mold, they'll they'll do. But it forces you to have to look at the product insert to see how it's made. Anything else? Anything for our remote folks? Doesn't appear so. They say we're bored. So, okay, go about your business. Thank you. Much.